Can you restate your um, argument about jurisdiction insofar as you suggested that um, Gertz retains a common law authority despite any ruling of the court? I, that sound, sounds an awful lot like you're saying that if the federal court were to um, decide that Mr. Reed wins um, under Article 64, otherwise his procedural due, due process claim, Gertz could say, I don't care, I'm not going to give it to him. So can you help me understand what you mean by this? Certainly, Your Honor. As Mr. Reed acknowledged in argument, uh, Gertz has, there's essentially two different, entirely separate avenues by which a prisoner in Texas can seek DNA testing. One is by agreement with a prosecutor. Article 64 does not bind that in any way. It does not cabin a prosecutor's discretion whether to issue DNA testing. It does not impose any requirements on a prosecutor. It's essentially a plenary common law privilege that the Court of Criminal Appeals has recognized. Chapter 64 governs how individuals seeking through motions in Chapter 64 seek DNA through the court system. It's an elaborate procedure that once it's begun, a, an individual who has such relevant DNA evidence has to surrender. All right, so what happens if the person seeks DNA testing under Chapter 64 through the courts and the courts decide that the person wins, they get DNA testing? Are you suggesting that the prosecutor's independent common law authority could somehow override that and the prosecutor could say, I disagree with the court and I'm not going to give it to you? Absolutely not, Your Honor. Texas law, of course, provides that individuals who've brought Chapter 64 motions, individuals with relevant DNA, have to deposit that with the court. The court would issue an order providing for DNA testing on its own, and that order would go off to whoever the custodian was, and that would be followed. All right. So if, if your point is that we have a jurisdictional problem in this case because Mr. Reed has named uh, Gertz, and Gertz would only have authority over this under his common law principles, why isn't the answer just let him amend the complaint to sue the relevant person? I mean, that's sort of what happens. It's not that we say no standing and we dismiss the case ordinarily. A child court would say, oh, you have a problem because you've named the wrong official. Let's just allow for substitution. So why, why isn't that the answer? Certainly, Your Honor, in part because he'd ultimately, no matter what, have a problem under Ex parte Young. As this court put in Whole Women's Health, the plurality joined by Justice Thomas, the requirements for Article III standing in Ex parte Young for getting around the sovereign immunity of, for example, the Court of Criminal Appeals requires something like an immediate or impending enforcement action. There is no such enforcement Okay, but that's action. just an argument that Article 64 can't, the right that is given, can't be enforced because to the extent that the court is the one that would hold the evidence and under Article 64, you as a prisoner um, come to the court and you invoke that provision, but it's the court that holds it and under Ex parte Young, you can't really sue the court. You're just saying that's a, that's a no right. And, and I don't understand how the law would be constructed in that way. Respectfully, I disagree, Your Honor, for two reasons. The more important one being that the petition that Mr. Reed sought under Section 1257 to this court was a proper vehicle for alleging a due process problem in the Court of Criminal Appeals. He, as a matter of fact, in that petition raises substantively identical due process challenges as he raises. So you're saying there's no 1983 today. claim that can be brought to enforce an Article 64 Right. At least not like this, Your Honor. And, and we agree that that's inconsistent with the exercise of jurisdiction this court impliedly allowed in Skinner. As this court has put in Steel Co., though, those sorts of questions that are neither passed upon or briefed. No, 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 not, not impliedly right. That was the basis of the Skinner Rooker Feldman analysis. I mean, isn't that what the court said? You, and in Osborne, you, could, you can bring this kind of claim in federal court. S uh, says this court in Osborne and Skinner, no? Two points, Your Honor. First, as this court puts in, in Steel Co., essentially implied exercises or blessings of jurisdiction that are not actually made holdings of the court don't bind the court going forward. Now, the court did make a jurisdictional determination regarding Rooker Feldman that I think actually is important in this case also because the court determined in its opinion specifically relying on a concession that's not been made by Mr. Reed, specifically that his claim was not challenging anything that either the prosecutor did 
or that the Court of Criminal Appeals did. Mr. Reed has already indicated in his response to Justice Barrett that his claim does, in fact, challenge certain aspects of how the Court of Criminal Appeals reached its decision making. So even on the, the narrow Rooker Feldman point, Skinner doesn't All right, find but what about the Osborne point that seemed to preserve the ability to bring a 1983 claim that raised procedural due process concerns? And you're saying here that there really is no way for Mr. Reed to bring such a claim in this circumstance. So isn't that inconsistent with what I guess you're saying we, the court implicitly held in Osborne, but that was sort of the basis of um, the court's constitutional analysis in this case. It, it's certainly inconsistent, Your Honor. The reason why we're not calling for Skinner to be overruled on this point is because this court has said specifically it is not bound by those, as Justice Scalia colorfully put it, drive-by jurisdictional analyses. But we agree that this is inconsistent beforehand. Nonetheless, even if this court were to essentially bless the exercise of jurisdiction asserted in, in a in Skinner and to continue from the merits, we should nonetheless fail on the merits because for several reasons. Mr. Chief Justice, one important concern you highlighted was the practical concerns about essentially everyone else. Mr. Reed's rule, which as far as we can discern today, involves that his claim accrues as soon as he chooses to stop litigating in the state court system and neither a moment before nor a moment later, does a profound disservice to the typical DNA applicant who is not fighting off a capital sentence, who has been accused and convicted of a crime, and who wants one of two things either resort to a constitutionally sound system that does not violate due process or resort to a federal forum as soon as possible. Now, while he says now that his claim might have existed as soon as he exited the federal forum, of course, he claimed on page 17 of his brief that his claim didn't even exist yet until he had exhausted going through the state appellate process at minimum. So that's an important shift that he's made. I think, Justice Alito, when you pointed out inquiring whether or not a person would have a claim if, for example, the prosecutor said, well, I understand my, right, my authority to run coterminously with Chapter 64, and the Court of Criminal Appeals has said thus and such, certainly the claim accrues then because he's, been, he's suffered a denial based on that unconstitutional condition. Another point, of course, is ours is an incredibly easy to administer rule. Because a Skinner claim arises essentially from a judicial decision in essentially all postures, every judicial decision has a file stamp date. Someone running a Skinner claim or making a Skinner claim is going to point to a condition that they say, this is the thing that violates due process. But easy to administer or no, what's the point? If he goes to federal court pursuant to your rule while he's in state court, the federal court will just stay the action until the state court action commend or, or uh, concludes. So what difference does it make? I don't know. I, I thought the most compelling part of Mr. Reed's merits claim or argument was that the, none of the purposes of the statutes of, of limitations, the principles behind that doctrine, obtain in your rule, that it doesn't matter whether or not, other than just to keep uh, a prisoner from ultimately being able to bring a federal claim. Quite the opposite, Your Honor. In the ordinary case, our rule serves most individuals who want to be able to bring those federal claims. Recall that Mr. Reed's rule requires them to go through the state appellate system before, in fact, or at least the rule he advocated for in his brief, before they have a claim accrue. Someone like that, a person who is suffering under a term no, of no, no, no. The sentence. state, of, the statute of limitations is not about the person who's bringing the claim. It's about the defendant, right? So the pro the purposes that I'm trying to focus in on are the traditional purposes of a statute of limitations, which protects the defendant. So why is the defendant in any different position? Not the person who's bringing the claim, but the defendant, the state. If we run the rule your way versus Mr. Reed's way. Let me answer your question. And let me explain why I believe that's tied to accrual, even on the plaintiff side. The answer to your question is, of course, states are best served by having defined dates that are not manipulable by individuals who are seeking to extend the length of their claims as long as possible. 
Every statute of limitations is on some level a statute of repose that gives someone who is exposed to potential tort claims or other claims definition as to when they no longer have to be on essentially preparing for litigation for those things. Now, the flip side of that is an accrual rule typically marks when an individual may first bring suit. There's, I heard though, the, though this court discussed the possibility of it being a claim that could be brought but that has not yet accrued, that is a very strange possibility. So when we're talking about an accrual rule that, is sooner in, that happens sooner in time, it serves state interests by giving states defined earlier and faster knowledge about what kind of, essentially what claims are against it. It also serves plaintiffs because once their claims accrue, they have resort to a federal forum. So an individual who has to labor underneath Mr. Reed's rule where claims do not accrue at least until the end of the appellate but process. there's no exhaustion, so he's still fine. There's no exhaustion requirement, so he can all, do you disagree with the representation that he can go to federal court at any, at any time in this world? I agree that he may go to federal court as soon as he has suffered essentially the due process the due process violation, but I would point out that's inconsistent with what he briefed to this court. But no but accrual date keeps him from going to federal court, right? It, if his claim hasn't accrued, Your Honor, at least as this court suggested in Madonna, a claim that hasn't accrued can't be brought. An individual cannot bring a claim that is not yet accrued. An individual could say, well, your claim isn't ripe yet for one reason or another. It hasn't yet accrued. That's, that is the function of an accrual date from a plaintiff's side. On a statute of limitations. Yes, Your Honor. If a claim is not yet accrued, ordinarily an individual can't bring it at all. 